hungry. Hey there, it's me, Lisa Lillian, also known as Hungry Girl. This week on Chew the Right Thing, I have something a little bit different for you. I am flying solo. Mikey and Jamie are safe at home where most of you are. And if you can be, you should be. Um, But I have a one-on-one interview with a very good friend of mine. He is an infectious disease specialist in Memphis, Tennessee. His name is Dr. Steve Threlkeld, and I think you're really going to benefit from what he has to say. He is extremely informative. He's a great communicator, and he's so, so knowledgeable about all of this. He is working tirelessly on the front lines in Memphis, and um, we're just going to jump right in. Thanks, Dr. Steve. Welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's great to be with you, Lisa. Good. Thank you so much. I truly cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your crazy, insanely busy schedule to talk to me and help provide all the Hungry Girl fans with some really important information. I always love talking to you, Lisa. I want to jump in, and I know this is not going to come as a surprise to you, but I want to start by talking about food and groceries. (laughs) Sure. Um, And these questions, I have to tell you, all the questions I'm asking you today came from our audience. They were very eager to hear answers to these things. And one of the things that everybody is thinking about, worrying about is, do we have to really worry about the food that we pick up at the market? And are there any things that we can do when we bring food into the house from the market? Yeah, I think, you know, the good news is, is that it's not There are no data or information out there that would suggest that it's got any primary nature as a foodborne infection. So it's not it's not typically like that. Although anything that you're picking up and the very container that it's packaged in that they give to you, uh, that's something that someone else touched. And presumably folks in the food industry are wearing gloves and washing their hands and doing that sort of thing. It sort of gets your attention because that's a prominent way this this uh, this infection is passed by someone with the infection touching a common object. You then touch it, then touch your face without washing your hands. So probably the container is as much of a problem as anything else. Heat inactivates this virus fairly efficiently. So if it's hot when you pick it up, it's probably fine, and you can always put it in the microwave briefly and uh, and sort of kind of uh, add to that a bit. I think probably the biggest thing is just to wash your hands after you handle the containers that the food might be in. You can always take it out of that container, put it on your own plate, put it in the microwave briefly. And then, of course, wash those things that are not to be cooked and are going to be kind of at room temperature or chilled just to make sure that no one else, no one else touched that with the infection that could then potentially pass it on probably more primarily to your hands than anything else. And what about the containers from the food at the market? So we come home, we unpack the the grocery bags. Should we be wiping down those containers? Does does the virus die when you put it in the refrigerator, the freezer? How strict should we be cleaning those packages? Yeah. So it's really more heat and, and uh, that sort of thing that, that inactivates these viruses than, than, than cool. So, um, you know, the main thing is just to make sure you, you're going to put those packages somewhere else. And, and some of the porous materials, it probably doesn't do quite as well on those materials as it does on sort of glass and, uh, and metal. So your bigger problem is doorknobs that you, you open to, to get out of the, the supermarket or if there's a doorknob or something in an elevator like a button. So those other container items are probably less of an issue. But to be perfectly honest, we don't have good studies about such things. So it's always good to just use common sense. And, and when you discard those things, wash your hands. And, and unless it actually transfers you know, from those containers where someone else touched it, then to your hands and then to your face without breaking that cycle by washing your hands, you're probably okay. And I think that's a very minor kind of issue compared to the other exposures we get to this virus. And would it seem, I mean, to me, it seems that if I have someone else do my shopping and I have like limited contact with a supermarket cart and touching packages at the market and coming home and touching doors, do you think it's safer if you use one of the services where they actually shop for you and drop off the food at your house? You know, it very well may be. It, it, it has. There are a lot of variables there. You know, it depends on you want to make sure the person delivering it does not have infection. And sometimes people have very low symptoms with this infection. Most people don't get very sick and sometimes don't even know they have it uh, in some ways. So obviously that, that's a variable. And then also an individual supermarket. Yes, it depends on how crowded it is. If you're in a line waiting to check out uh, with someone, uh, that that's a potential risk. Obviously, we want to stay as apart as we can right now. But theoretically, yeah, that, that could be a benefit provided you 
you just kind of clean off the, the, uh, the, the, your hands after you, you handle that. But yes, the fewer people that you can be around closely right now is one of those principles that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to adhere to, not, not just because of the laws and the regulations, but if you're not within six feet of somebody and being coughed and sneezed on and handling common items, you're going to be safer. You're not going to get this infection and then you're not going to pass it on to someone who's a loved one who might be older and have even a, a bigger problem with the infection than you might. Mm-hmm. And as far as and you touched on this a little earlier, I like to support local businesses. I I want all my favorite restaurants to be there when things get back to normal. So I'm trying Absolutely. to support them. And so I am doing takeout. Uh, you're saying that if I put the food in the microwave, is there an amount of time I should microwave it for? How hot does the food have to be in order to make it safe? It, does, it doesn't take a whole lot of heat. I mean, people have talked about refurbishing you know, hospital mass, and they'll do it for you know 158 degrees for half an hour. So the microwave would be much faster. Um, and I agree. I mean, I've been doing a lot of takeout too, and uh, I've had, I haven't had a bit of a of a concern about that. I just I take it. I take it out of the container. I wash my hands. I put it on a plate of my own, and I microwave it for however long it takes to make it hot. If it's hot, you're probably okay under under almost all circumstances. And you're going to wash off the other things that aren't hot, you know, in soap and water, and and, and that should take care of it as well for those other items. You, what you mean, like your salad? Sure. Well, well, that's right. With soap and water. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good point. That's not going to help you with your salad, but fruit, those kind of things that are that are you know truly raw and so forth. Um, right. And you know, the good news is there's just not a lot of there's not there are not a lot of data out there that suggest that that's a significant problem. And you know, Anthony Fauci of the NIH has said you know that's really not a not a big concern, and I, and I tend to agree. We just haven't had a lot of data that, that it is much of a risk. Um, but the things that I can uh, have hot, I usually do because that's just that much more of a buffer against any kind of possibility that somebody might not have washed their hands well and, and could possibly have infected themselves. That's really the, the main risk, and I think it's very small under most circumstances, really. Mm-hmm. And what about, like, I'm a big online, I order a lot of boxes from Amazon and things. What about the safety of the mail and the packages? I keep hearing different things about how long the viruses can live on cardboard or on various surfaces. How long do we do we need to leave the packages outside before taking them in the house? Yeah, and, and there's a lot of um, – the reason you hear a lot of things is that there are a lot of debate about those things. And on some surfaces, this virus can live for a few days. Uh, probably a little less on the cardboard kind of surfaces. I frankly don't worry too much about leaving them outside for a long period of time. I open whatever packages I have uh, and I wash my hands once I, you know, when, once I'm through handling those things that could possibly be common materials. You're eventually going to get something to something down inside that has been wrapped and has not been touched by anybody else. That's really the principle is is if someone else has touched something, uh, you know, in the recent past, particularly that that's the only way that those things would really potentially pass on to you. Probably doesn't last a long time on those sorts of surfaces. But again, common sense. I just wash my hands after I touch any item that someone could have uh, could have touched in, in the recent past. And some people say, well, you know, could it have been touched in a few hours or not? And I don't worry about doing the math on that. It, it, once I use uh, my hands on something that's been a common uh, a common object, I just wash it and be done with it. You know, you're good then. You don't have to worry about it. Great. Now, uh, people have general questions just about the virus, and we hear these things time and time again. And the one thing that I've heard over and over, people are wanting to know if they get infected, if they've had it, could they get it again? Is it the kind of thing like there are different strains of it, like the flu? Yeah. So so with the caveat that this is the first time we've seen this virus, and it's very difficult to be definitive about those sorts of things because we just don't know for sure, if it behaves like almost every other um, respiratory virus that we know of, including other members of the coronavirus family, if this thing, is com- if this thing comes back, uh, you know, later in the year or next year, you're probably going to be largely protected. I think at the very least, you would have you know minimal you know minimal disease and a much 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 lighter case of something if that happened, and you probably would be completely immune. How long that immunity lasts in terms of years is a little bit different thing because part of the reason that we have to take a flu shot every year is that the flu virus mutates just in small amounts as it goes around the globe and circulates back to us next year just far enough along that our body's not quite used to the new one and the vaccine doesn't protect us against the new one. 
it is possible that that could happen with this coronavirus as well. We're hoping that this virus doesn't tolerate the warm weather as well, but we just don't know that yet. But there's there's every reason to believe that this is not the kind of thing that you would be at at significant risk from being ill from it next year if it were to come back. So we do think you you probably do get immunity, but again, you can only go so far but to guarantee that in a virus that we just that we've just seen for the first time and have never been able to measure such a thing yet. Mm-hmm. And as far as symptoms are concerned, the thing that confuses me personally, I have several friends that actually have the virus and yes. they seem to be doing fine. And some of them have hardly any symptoms at all. Like I have one friend and he had a slight fever for a couple of days and then mm-hmm. he lost his sense of taste and smell. And that yes. was it. No other symptoms. Why are the symptoms so varied? And and people are everyone is thinking that they have symptoms and these psychosomatic symptoms, can they really present themselves as real? Yeah, it's so difficult. It's so difficult because it really does have such a wide variety, not only of the severity of the symptoms, but as you point out, the symptoms themselves. Uh, we didn't really realize the loss of taste and smell until more recently. We didn't hear about a lot of that, and you know, from from some of the Chinese data, at least as I was hearing them early on. But you know, eighty percent probably plus of the people with this infection are not going to be sick enough to require any attention from your doctor. So in, in many people, most people even, it's a very mild illness that barely gets their attention. The problem is it can also be extremely deadly. And most of the people that get those sorts of severe infections tend to be in the older age group. They tend to have underlying medical problems like heart problems, lung problems, sometimes diabetes, uh, though it's it's fair to say that we've seen a number of people that are otherwise young and healthy healthy down into the 20s in the United States who had severe illness. It does happen, but still not to the degree that it does in the elderly and those with all of those other medical conditions. Um, I've looked over, uh, I've read off to someone the other day at a the press conference about the 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 the, uh, the different symptoms, and I, I just read down the list that this one person had, and 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 he had you know headache, muscle aches, sore throat, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, loss of taste and smell. I mean, there are just a lot of things that this virus can do, and occasionally it does a lot of them in a you know in an individual patient. Um, but the variety makes it very difficult. And interestingly, the fact that most people don't get very sick from it makes it harder for us because uh, you know, Ebola, measles, those kind of things, you don't miss those cases. And when you see them, you can kind of put a dragnet around anybody who's been around that patient and do a better job of controlling the virus. Here, it's chasing a ghost. You and I might not get sick at all, and we might give it to three people, one of whom gets very ill, but there's a very difficult time tracing it back to where it came from. So it's hard to keep this under wraps and it's why the virus is spreading so effectively, and, and we have such a hard time kind of corralling it, I think. So scary. And yeah. I know you mentioned that most of the people that are getting very ill and they're older or they have underlying conditions. But as you say, a lot of younger people are getting really sick now as well. And I have heard things like people with different blood types are affected differently. People with high cholesterol are affected differently. Have you heard any of those things? Are you seeing those things? I heard that people who have type A blood are getting this more severely than people that have type O blood or people that have high cholesterol are getting it more severely. Have you seen that? Yeah, I haven't seen that personally in the cases that we've had, and I think a lot of that is still very much up in the air. There's something about this situation. In some ways, it's a blessing. It is it is unprecedented the amount of scientific material that has been you know that's that's been come out from uh, all of the information that we've seen. We had the sequence of the virus with RNA within just a couple of weeks of its recognition. We have information that's being studied and thrown out there. And it's important for people to remember that this is not the typical pace of scientific knowledge. Usually you you learn about something and you put out a paper and people critique it and they try to replicate it. And all these things takes, you know, take months and stuff to do. Now, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of information thrown out there very quickly because it's a severe problem that we want to have an impact on. And we have. It's amazing that there are already vaccine trials uh, that are that are getting underway. I mean, at a, again, an unprecedented sort of pace that we've seen that. But it also lends to think things, uh, just as a different example, you know, the ibuprofen example. Uh, it was rumored by some of the French folks that ibuprofen uh, caused people to have to do much worse with the virus. And that was out there for about 24 hours. And you know, before 24 to 48 hours were over, uh, that had to be walked back because other, other experts came out and said, you know, that's just not true. We, we've not seen that. There's no reason why that should be true. 
And in fact, there has been uh, there, there's been no evidence to date that that was the case. But you know, we're throwing out things pretty quickly here. And the key is that we want to be conservative. We want to do the safe thing. Uh, but every now and then we'll find that we move a little too fast and we have to back up. That shouldn't necessarily make people less confident in what they're hearing as long as we're trying to do the safest, most aggressive uh, sorts of things to protect people. We may find out that some of the things that we're doing to protect people really may not necessarily uh, be required as, as we learn more later. And speaking of that, like th there was so much controversy over whether or not we should be wearing masks and the type of masks that we should be wearing. And are they effective and they are they protecting us or are they protecting others? Where are we right now with the whole mask situation? Yeah, it's, it's extremely confusing. It really is. Um, there were some comments made by the head of the Chinese equivalent of the CDC uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, that said everyone should be wearing masks. And uh, we Americans should definitely all do that. Um, but, you know, the CDC and the World Health Organization have not made that statement. Their their, their posture has been um, it's great to wear a mask if you are ill because it prevents you from as efficiently spraying your secretions around and potentially infecting others. I think everybody just about would agree with that. Um, what's a lot less clear is that it protects you just walking down the street or even in even in an airport kind of situation um, to, that it protects a normal, healthy person uh, from getting ill. There, there are some downsides of wearing a mask, and that's that's important to factor into that equation. Uh, for example, a mask is scratchy and uncomfortable, and people tend to adjust their mask um, all day if they're wearing one. And, and what is that except touching your face? A thing that we're trying to get people to avoid at all costs is touching their face. It's hard enough to do that mm -hmm. anyway. People touch their face all the time, even when they're trying not to. Um, but when you're having to touch a mask and adjust it, you can end up taking the more important vector for getting you infected, and that is your hands. You may have touched a countertop or something else or a doorknob that someone infected did. And then what do you do? You inoculate yourself by touching your face, your eyes, your mouth by, by manipulating that mask. So the bottom line is the jury might be out for some time over exactly where masks are helpful. Um, but if you're going to wear one, just make sure that you're not uh, doing some of those things that might unwittingly um, cause you a higher risk of getting infected. So being on the safe side, um, always at first you have to figure out which the safe side is, right? And, and, uh, and masks are one of those things right now that uh, that it's sort of a double-edged sword, I think. And it's not true, of course, if you're a healthcare worker. If you're in someone's face taking care of them, it's clear that that, that is uh, that, that's necessary and helpful. And we wear gowns and goggles and masks and gloves and all of that. Um, you hear people say, well, you, you shouldn't be wearing a mask because we'll, they'll run out for the healthcare workers later. And that is true. I mean, we, we want our emergency department workers to have all the all the things that they need to stay on the job. Because if we come into our emergency department with a heart attack, you know, we want them to be on the job and taking care of us. Same time, it's not, it's not a sufficient uh, reason to make people satisfied to say, hey, you shouldn't be using them because we may need them later. You know, it's not very satisfying for people to hear. But in truth – if you look at it, there are no new data that have come out that say uh, masks are, are really effective at keeping you from getting sick if you wear them. They're pretty good data that if you are sick, it's nice to wear one if you can to keep from sneezing on, on other people. That, that, that much, I think we do know. Mm -hmm. And so where do you stand on gloves? Do gloves help the situation or make it worse? Well, it, it's, a, it's a very similar thing with gloves. I mean, I mean, I wear gloves uh, on many patients in the hospital, if not most patients in the hospital, every day, uh, long before this virus came on. But you have to use them correctly, right? You have to realize that if you touch something with your glove, it's the same as touching them with your bare hand. And when you take those gloves off, which you need to do frequently if, if they get contaminated at all, you have to wash your hands carefully, preferably with soap and water, but with an alcohol uh, cleaning solution if, uh, if that's all you have. So it's kind of, again, a double-edged sword like the mask. It, they can be helpful in some circumstances, though probably all you need to do with this virus is just to wash your hands. And if you're wearing gloves and not using them properly, you can end up causing really more risk to yourself than not wearing them at all. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I see some people like using their gloves, touching everything, smoking cigarettes. And I'm thinking that can't be good. Like I just uh, watch no. people out in public making really bad choices. No, it, it's really true. If uh, you can't – and that kind of goes back to the mask and the glove thing. Um, I think both – we have to be careful. A false sense of security can can be had 
by wearing something that we think is going to be very effective. And that, that feeling of being naked out there without mask and gloves on can weirdly be a protective uh, kind of thing, right? I mean, it makes you more careful to wash your hands and not to touch your face. And, and, uh, and being a little being a little paranoid about this is is a good thing because we don't do a very good job in society of washing our hands. Uh, we, we we never have really. Um, but this sort of thing uh, will, will hopefully will awaken us to that because it's not terribly complicated to, to help cut down the risk of this infection. It's the same as your grandmother taught you, right? I mean, you wash your hands, you cough into your elbow, you don't go out if you're sick, you don't get within three to six feet of someone who looks like they're sick. Uh, with the caveat that some people don't look very sick with this infection, of course. But right, utilizing those typical fundamental hand hygiene and infection control principles are as important, more important today even than they have been. And they will be important in years to come when the flu comes back. And that can save lives moving forward if we practice these things correctly long after uh, we hope coronavirus is gone. Yeah, I think we are ultimately going to be a lot more um, sanitary and a cleaner society in general when all of this is said and done, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, would you say that because we're hearing more and more about the virus that it, it lives in the air and can live in the air for, uh, you know, I don't know how many seconds after somebody sneezes or coughs, is it safe to walk outside? Is it safe to be out in the open air? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, th- remember that those, those studies that people quote were, were situations where they tried to aerosolize. They were spraying the virus into an area, into droplets to see how long it could survive in those droplets. So even in a room with someone else, it's not entirely clear. These are, tend to be larger droplets and they tend to kind of settle down toward the floor fairly rapidly. Um, but when you get into a situation like outside, you're way, way, way beyond diluting any, even if somebody sneezes uh, 20 feet from you, you, you really have no um, legitimate risk of uh, being outside like that. So, so when I see people walking their dogs, and I have never seen as many people walking their dogs as I have in the last uh, in the last week or so, um, you know, it, it does kind of break my heart to see people wearing masks when they're walking their dog 100 yards away from any other human being, because we really are just burning the mask then. Uh, we're not really doing anything to help ourselves. And, you know, there are people that need those masks in, 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 in various cities in the country. So it does make sense not to use them when they, when they really have no benefit. And being outside in open air, I think, is one of those situations. Okay. And as far as the social distancing, how long do you think it needs to last? How long do you see this lasting, this severe social social distancing that we're doing now? Do you think that'll last weeks, months? Well, that of course is literally the multi-million dollar question and, and it's 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 damaging to people and, and uh it's damaging to, to a lot of folks and their livelihoods and, and it's a very painful kind of situation. I will say that right now when we see the sort of things that we're that we're seeing happening in New Orleans and, and New York City, uh we are just at the base of the curve here that we do not want to be a mountain. And if we can do something to blunt the curve, as has become kind of the cliche now, not only are you cutting down the total number of people that might get sick and even die, you're also cutting down the rapidity with which this virus attacks us. And when you do that, if you have, let's say, a 1,000 people are going to get sick with this in your town, even if you don't cut the total number, which you certainly would, you'd like for those people to present over you know, three months rather than three weeks. Because if they present over three weeks, you're going to have the possibility of overwhelming the healthcare system in your town. And that's where we really get into trouble when healthcare workers are getting sick and they're not there to take care of you and there aren't enough beds and, and these sorts of things that we saw in China and, and even to a degree in New York. It's 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 heartbreaking to see that. And, and that's what we really want to avoid. So the virus is going to determine that for us. It's going to be hard to predict. And people that have tried to predict, you know, we see it go back and forth. And they say by this time and by that time. Um, and, it, and again, it's heartbreaking to see some of the effects on people's lives. But at the same time, uh, I think the effects that we hope we'll have enough by doing these things, that there'll be a lot more people alive to help us dig out of the, uh, of the economic deal uh, for having done this. I really think that's the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, people are always asking where they can find up to the minute information and resources about all the latest developments. Are there any websites any resources that you can recommend where people can check them regularly? 
Yeah, I think there are two uh, primary ones that, that, that are very good. And one is the Centers for Disease Control uh, site at, uh, at cdc.gov. And then also the World Health Organization is always a wealth of information as well. Uh, they deal with these uh, epidemics all over the world as well, of course, as the pandemics. They have videos. They have uh, a lot of explanatory material. And they have up-to-date material on the pace of the infection, the numbers of infections, uh, different countries, different states, et cetera. So those two are, are, are always reliable sources uh, for, for you to get up-to-date information from. Great. I know we covered a lot here. Is there anything else you think is important for people to know that we didn't touch on? No, I, I think it's basically all of these things, and you said it actually, you, we hope, despite the fact that I always quibble that we tend to have short epidemiologic memories, we sort of forget these things and move on. But I, like you, hope that this will kind of awaken us to realize that you know the flu comes to town and kills tens of thousands of people in the United States every year, every year. And so if we can do the sorts of things uh, like hand washing and proper sorts of basic, uh, basic infection control techniques, you know, we stand to save thousands of lives moving forward. And so, you know, we hope that this teaches us a lesson and helps us to do better as a society moving forward, because I think we really can save lives just from the lessons we've learned here and through, the, through this tragic situation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I, you are truly the best. You are on the front lines in Memphis. You are saving lives. You are barely getting any sleep. You've taken the time out of your ridiculously crazy busy schedule to talk to us and fill us in on all this information. It is so helpful and truly you are the greatest. Keep it up. It is my pleasure. It's great to be with you, Lisa. So much amazing info I think we all can benefit from. If you have friends that you think might benefit from this information as well, you should definitely share this podcast with them. And while you share it, you could tell them that they should subscribe. And if you don't subscribe, you should subscribe. And you all should be subscribing to the Hungry Girl Daily Emails filled with tips, tricks, food finds, recipes, and everything you need, especially during this difficult time. Really, really hope you enjoyed this podcast. I enjoyed that interview so much and really appreciate Dr. Steve. If you want to know more about him, you can check out our Foodcast page at hungry-girl.com slash foodcast. And remember to tune in next week because we will be back. Until then, please stay safe, stay at home, be wise, sanitize, wash your hands, don't touch your face. I'm Lisa Lillian. Till next time, chew the right thing.